So well, welcome to today's session for our recent for our ECTs looking at EAL with the Bell Foundation today. You've got the lovely Emily and Karen working with you. They're going to take you through a variety of topics today. So please take the time to ask the questions, get involved in tasks. But at this point, I'm going to hand you over to the lovely Karen to start your session. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Cheryl, for that. So a uh, really warm welcome to you all. Um, and thank you for joining us uh, to this after joining us for this afternoon's uh, webinar, which is about comprehensive comprehensible English for new arrivals using EAL. So I'm Karen, Karen, and this is Emily. Do you want to give us a wave, Emily? Yeah. Hi there. <laughs> um, my colleague will be taking over from me about halfway through the webinar. Okay. Here's our learning intentions. Today, as we said, we're considering what is comprehensible language use, particularly for learners who are new to English. Uh, we're going to explore a range of easy to use strategies for giving clear instructions for checking understanding so that all new arrivals using the AL will be able to understand their teachers in a range of situations and will be able to access curriculum content when it's accompanied by the appropriate language support. So your mentors have had um, training already on the early careers teachers framework. You've had uh, one on the 9th of March, understanding context, policies and pedagogy related to EAL. This is today's uh, comprehensible English for learners who are new to English. And on the 26th of April, you've got learning for learning, planning to meet the language needs of the curriculum. So that's just to remind you what's been done and what's coming. So we've got our first task here this afternoon um, and um, on your own, find an open voice recorder on your, find and open the voice recorder on the, your phone or tablet, test the volume and adjust the volume set as you need it. Think of something you've asked your class to do this week. Imagine you're speaking to your students and explain the task or activity to them as they are about to do it when you are ready. Um, and when you are ready, record your instructions. That should just take a few minutes to do. Give you a few minutes to do that. You'll need this recording a bit later. So um, just a statement to kind of set the context for us in terms of the importance of language learning. Um, so schooling is fundamentally a linguistic process. Um, content, as, you, as we know, is presented, is assessed through language. Students need to understand and use ever more complex language alongside the increasing cognitive demands um, of subject knowledge. So that's why we need to look at how we grade our language um, for our EAL learners um, so that they're able to, to access this um, subject knowledge. So it's just a statement there for you, a comment um, ref references at the bottom. So we look briefly at the uh, early careers framework. So what I want to draw the attention to here is the fact that there is no mention of EAL in the early career framework, even though 19.4% of our learners in state schools uh, being identified as EAL um, and multilingual um, is clear, clearly a feature of our schools um, in our present day. So what the ESF uh, Early Career Framework does is acknowledges that learners with special educational needs or disabilities are likely to require additional or adapted support, but this is not, uh, but, but EAL is really not mentioned um, as a distinctive group. Uh, so what we don't want is um, for EAL to be conflated with uh, special educational needs and disabilities because they are two very distinct areas with very uh, different distinct needs. Um, last year, um, this statement was um, framed in, in another webinar, um, uh, in the uh, initial teachers training webinar, in fact, by Dr. Jean Conte. Um, and you can see here that the fact that EAL is not singled out as a separate issue can be made, could be, could be a positive reflection. Um, and the thought is that it could, you know, we could start normalizing diversity in mainstream schooling. Um, so it becomes central and part of school life and school experience. That's, that's a really good thing uh, in many ways. 
if that opportunity and that mindset um, is taken forward from, from a statement like this, but it comes with a risk. Um, you know, it could be that differences couldn't be, uh, differences could be flattened and we may not um, see that there are distinct needs um, for EAL learners because what they have is a double job to do. They have to learn English, learn the subject content and learn subject content through English. So they have that double job to do all the time. And the distinctive features that, that needs to uh, be met are their, their language needs very much to support their access to the curriculum. So um, next, what we're going to do is we're going to watch a video. Um, it's a year two maths lesson on the topic of shapes. Um, so I'll show you that clip in a minute. I want you to watch it on your own, first of all. And I want you, while you're watching it, think about how comprehensible the instructions and questions are for the learners using English as an additional language. 24 sheep have to be shepherded into three pens of different sizes. There must be a different even number of sheep in each pen. The smallest pen must contain the smallest number of sheep. The largest pen, the largest number. Before we start our problem, I want you to understand what the problem is about. The first time I read this problem, I got so confused because I didn't know what it meant. So what I'm going to do is introduce you to the farmer. Okay, that's the farmer. Hi kids, I've got a problem that needs solving. Do you think you can help me? How many sheep might the dog try to get into each pen? Find as many different ways as you can. So what does it mean if we're going to solve something systematically, Miss Miller? Well, you remember when we've done about chronological order in our literacy lessons? Yeah? It's a bit like that, isn't it, Miss Miller? It it's like working in a systematic order. You work from one place to another. So I've got two, four. Can you six over here come and squeeze onto the mat? And four of you. Great. So that's six and four, so that's ten. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Let me just check this against the rules. Miss Miller, can you remind us about the rules and we'll check for you? An even number of sheep in each pen. A different even number. Different so even two. number. Two. Smallest number of sheep in the smallest pen. Two is our smallest number. It's the smallest pen. Yes? Yeah. And the largest number of sheep in the largest pen. Oh, we can see that, can't we? Yeah. Right, you know what? I think we found one possibility. Two, four and eighteen. Think about what you'd like to do to find your next possibility. So would you change the number of sheep in the smallest pen or would you change the number of sheep in the middle pen? How many could we put in the middle pen now? In the envelopes, you've got three pieces of card. What do you think these represent, Akeeb? The pens. The pens, just like the mats in the hall. You've also got a copy of the rules. Why do you think you've got these, Eba? So you know what's going on. So you mean that you have to keep referring to these to check? You've also got in your envelope 24 little cutout sheep, okay? I want you to find as many answers as you can with only two sheep in the smallest pen. Start with what we've done in the hall. So we had two, and then in our medium pen we had four. Okay, it's Mr. Farmer back. Thanks, Year 5. With your help, I will be able to arrange the sheep in seven different ways. I think you have worked absolutely fantastically today, haven't they, Miss Miller? I think they have, and we've even got someone giving them a clap. Yeah. And you know, I've actually not worked in a Year 5 class before, where by the end of the lesson, everyone has found seven different answers. Mm -hmm. So I think you all deserve a good pat on the back. Well done. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so that's a typical maths lesson there, but um, in a moment, some statements will appear um, on the screen. And what I'd like you to do, just decide which statement you think explains how comprehensible the teacher's language uh, was that you heard in the video. 
and put the letter corresponding to a statement, either A, B or C, when you see them in a moment. Um, so here's your statements. So decide, um, well, actually it's one, two, three or four. Are they perfectly comprehensible? Only some word and phrase is comprehensible, but a lot of noise. Comprehensible overall, but learners might struggle with some words and phrases, totally or virtually incomprehensible. Okay, well, actually, the overall answer is it depends on the learner's proficiency in English. Um, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail now. So we have, um, in terms of comprehensible um, instructions by a teacher, however, how comprehensible instructions are by a teacher, it might be useful to think of these in terms of um, the English proficiency bands that we have in the Bell Foundation, um, where A is totally or virtually incomprehensible, B, some words or phrases, there's lots of noise, C is developing competence, and E is fluent, perfectly comprehensible, and crystal clear. Um, you know, you can see that if there were learners in the class at band B, some of those words and phrases would be quite difficult to follow and there'd be lots of noise in the classroom. Um, so looking at it in that way really helps to give you a bit of a, an overview of how to, to grade your, your language. And we look a bit further into that now. So this is band A, new to English. As we've mentioned, a band A learner mostly uses their first language. It'll understand some everyday English expressions. They'll remain silent in the classroom and they may copy and repeat some words and phrases and they have minimal or no English literacy. So that's an important consideration to um, of the amount of support they need in the classroom. So that would make those those instructions totally or virtually incomprehensible. In terms of support um, for a band B, um, they will need a considerable amount of support um, in the classroom. And you can see that a band B learner follows day-to-day -day social communication in English. They begin to use their spoken English uh, in the playground and for more social purposes around the school. They understand simple instructions. They can follow uh, narrative accounts with visual supports. They may have developed some skills in reading and writing, and they may have become familiar with some subject-specific vocabulary, but they will still need a significant amount of support in in the classroom to access it fully. So, and often a lot of instructions can feel like a lot of noise for learners at this band. Um, next, we have developing competence where um, a learner may participate in learning activities. They've got increasing independence. They're more confident expressing themselves more orally. Um, but you may hear some still may hear some still still may hear some structural inaccuracy inaccuracies. Literacy will require ongoing support for understanding text writing, and they'll be able to follow more abstract concepts and more complex written English. But they still need the support to access the curriculum fully, and particularly uh, sort of the direct teaching side of it as well, and what they're listening to and hearing from a teacher. So overall, things are comprehensible, but as I've highlighted, they still may struggle with vocabulary that they're hearing or phrases that you may be using. And finally, you've got competent, um, where overall they're developing well, they're engaging across the curriculum, they're pretty independent, they're reading and understanding uh, more wide varieties of texts and but their written English may lack complexity and there still will be errors in structures. Um, so they would need support with um, refining language, understanding abstract con concepts, abstract language, idioms, that kind of thing. So that's important to consider when you're uh, using language with learners at this stage. And your fluent learners um, can um, operate across the curriculum 
to a level of competence equivalent to that of a pupil who uses English as their first language. So things are generally perfectly comprehensible for a learner at this stage in the classroom. Um, so we can see that the summaries that I've shown you there are very rough generalizations of what a learner might be able to do. Uh, learners have spiky profiles, which means they may be speaking and listening at band D quite uh, proficiently, but as I've already mentioned, they may have, um, their writing skills may still be at a, at, at a B band. Um, so it's important to be very mindful of, of, this, uh, of, of these kind of profiles from your learners. Um, but this is sort of very natural in English language development, and it's useful to communicate this to, to you, to teachers, um, and for those responsible for EAL assessment in schools so that this is understood and so that the right support can be put in place um, for learners um, um, and to be responsive to their changes, changing needs as they go through the five stages. And this is highlighted in the early career, career framework again in standard five um, in the learn that statements. Um, we've just highlighted one here for you. Adapting teaching in a responsive way, including by providing targeted support to pupils who are struggling, is likely to increase uh, pupil success. And part of that um, adapting teaching would be um, your grading your, your language. So it's also important to note that spontaneous spoken English is only really accessible for learners who might be at a band D, um, who are progressing much closer to fluency. Uh, so one way that teachers can support a learner, can support, support the learning of their pupils using EAL is to control and modify their input, as I've mentioned a few times now, grading it to ensure that it is intelligible and comprehensible. It is therefore, you know, important to understand what it is and what it what isn't comprehensible input for learners using EAL at each band. And we'll mostly be focusing today on modifying inputs so that it's comprehensible for our learners at band A. And just um, in terms of what comprehensible input is, uh, this uh, comment here. Um, from Light Brown and Spider, Spader, sorry, describes it well. So as language that is modified to suit the capability of the learner um, is a crucial element in the language acquisition process. So that sort of sets, sets the context a bit further for you. Um, so finally from me, before I hand over to um, Emily, um, what I'd like you to do on your own, read it. Um, and for two minutes and think about what problems learners using EAL could have with the instructions given by the teacher. Um, so as a final sort of um, uh, a feedback moment before I hand over to Emily. And when you're ready, um, put your answers please to the questions in the chat box. As I said, I'll give you a couple of minutes to look through the four examples of instructions and put your response in the chat box. Thank you. Technical vocabulary, for example, visuals needed to be reinforced. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I agree with your point there. Exposure to particular language encourages growth in language skills. That's 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 true as well. But the visuals uh, should have been reinforced a bit more. Any more comments? In instruction three, they swap from counting to in twos. Yeah, yeah. That would be very confusing, particularly if you're a band A or B learner. OK, I'm going to move on now to um, share some feedback that we thought. So, so overall, um, we thought this. Some of you mentioned you know, the instructions are too long. 
um, instructions one, instruction four, instruction five, for example. They're pretty complex, uh, instructions one, two, four, and five. It was delivered really fast. Um, so that would be difficult for a lot of learners in, in the class and perhaps just a lot of learners generally. Um, instruction two was unclear. You've got words like pen. Um, so the meaning of that needed to be put into context so that they didn't know it was a pen that you write with. What, a, you know, maybe as, you, as um, one of your colleagues mentioned, um, technical vocabulary, a picture of a sheep pen would have been ideal. And the use of sheep dogs to herd sheep might be a very unfamiliar kind of concept to uh, a lot of learners. So that's what we thought um, about the teacher's language in, um, in that video. I'm now going to hand over to Emily. Thank you, Emily. And stop sharing my screen so that Emily can load hers up. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Karen. Um, so we're going to carry on looking at the... Um, uh, analyzing the language in a little bit more detail um, that the teacher used in that first video now. Um, so I'll share my screen with you briefly to set up our next task so that we can do that together. Um, okay, and this is what you're gonna do. Um, so have a look at task two of resource one and choose, um, I think, cause there's only three of us, three of you guys here today, you can have a look at, uh, I would say a minimum of two or three instructions um, and you can look at all of them if you want, um, and identify the essential instructions that the teacher wanted to give. So what's the main instruction? What is the key message instruction that the teacher wanted to give? Then delete any unnecessary language. And if you think it's appropriate, write the instruction out again, perhaps in the right order. Right, so welcome back everybody. Um, well, let's let's get going with um, instruction one. So um, I don't know if anyone would like to volunteer, or if you chose a spokesperson in the end, or if you just uh, thought you would eat uh, or not. But um, what did you think about for instruction one? Any I, any feedback on what, what were the um, essential instructions and what would you change it to? Hi, so... Um... Basically, we just said that the first part of the instructions was totally irrelevant, but how she was saying that she doesn't understand and they should have just jumped straight in with that. This is the farmer and this is what he wants you to do. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just share my screen again with you so we can see. Um, so, yeah, that is exactly what we've done. So all, all the crossed out red is exactly what we thought is it's not important it's actually um some of it not really relevant um so we changed it to this which is essentially i think what you've just said um so this <clears> farmer <throat> has a problem can you can you help him yeah okay um and for the next one how many sheep might the dog try to get into each pen any any feedback on that um, what we were saying was actually um, the instruction four, which talks about the rules and uh, it being an even number, we were actually saying that actually that should have gone um, in the beginning. It should have been um, before instruction two. So just outlining that actually this is the rule, um, because here it's almost assuming that the children will know. Um, that it's even I know that they've got something in their hand but just to have that kind of explanation and then going on to saying how many sheep might the dog try to get into each pen we felt that that might be a bit more suitable yeah so they have the information there and then they can refer back to it to be able to answer the question yeah yeah Absolutely. Um, we, we also changed the wording of this question slightly because um, there's the issue, it's quite, it's quite a complex uh, question. So how many sheep might the dog try to get 
into each pen so there's quite a, a few mm. different elements mm. to it and we've got very the modal good. verb might as well which is yeah. very straightforward for new arrival um, new to English learners so we suggest our suggestions are how many sheep can get into each pen then you take mm -hmm. the idea of the dog away mm -hmm. or how many sheep can the farmer put into each pen I and so. I think the reason why we took the dog out is because the, there's that cultural idea of uh, sheep dogs dogs herding sheep into pens which depending on where your learners come from they might not know mm -hmm. um, that that might be quite an alien concept so and then we've got instruction three um so any suggestions of of what you would change or how you'd rewrite it this one this instruction a bit confusing myself in all honesty mm -hmm. um so i would i would change it um I don't know how the others feel. I can't remember whether we talked about this, but I would probably change it and just make it really simple. I wouldn't even go on to 13, 14, 15. I would just keep it really simple. Mm -hmm. Charles, did you want to add something else to that? I heard that you started speaking as well. Oh, yeah. Um I agree. Absolutely. I think um, just keeping it as simple as possible and all this, um, you know, this jargon when we're talking out loud really doesn't have to be there. I think it just has to be so to the point. And I, I'm just a bit of a firm believer in this physical sort of like um, state of just bringing, you know, actually modelling and showing, right, I'm going to put two in this pen and moving the children stop and then, um, you know, modelling something else, for example. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I completely agree with both of you um, for exactly the same reasons that you've given. So we've simplified it to uh, to this as a, as a suggestion. So you six and then you can point at the six people, six children. Please come and sit on this mat and then point at the mat and you four point at the other four children and then um, come here. Great. So exactly a combination of, of what you've both said, really to the point pointing and um, just keeping it really straightforward and pausing as well. Um, so instruction four, um, we simplified it really just to Miss Miller, what were the rules? And again, we don't need we don't need this extra sort of narrating. And I think that's something that can happen, especially in primary schools and um, quite a lot sort of like talking around what, what's happening or what's going on. But actually that can be quite distracting for learners who are new to English. So just keep it straight to the point. And then for instruction five, Again, there's quite a lot of extra language that is not needed. So in that first, but we've got why ever in, rather than why do you think you've got these? So you can just keep that much shorter. Um, and then this complex uh, grammatical structures here. So you mean you'd have to keep referring. So that could be simplified to, so you have to refer. So you just keep things much simpler. Um, so an example that we could have for instruction five instead is um, you have the rules, why? You also have 24 sheep, and then you can say in your envelope, possibly show them. Find as many answers as you can. Start with two sheep in the smallest pen and four in the medium pen. And as you said, maybe lots of pointing as well. We've got uh, one another reflection task here. So we've we've looked at um, some features of natural spoken English that cause a barrier to understanding. And I wondered if um, you had any other ideas about other features that could cause difficulty. So um, one example is idioms. So idioms um, like food for thought that can be tricky. Um, you can either write the answers in the chat box or you can um, just let me know by turning your mic on. Any other features of natural spoken English that you think can create a barrier to understanding? for pupils who are new to English. Okay, no worries, we'll, get, we'll have a look at some of um, some features that we've um, highlighted as the most important, some of the most important ones or ones that come up the most. So we've got speed of delivery, which Karen touched on before. So something that's very fast is gonna be in, not very comprehensible. Long utterances, um, so we've got an example here that we saw before. And then also false starts, backtracking and hesitation. So a false start um, uh, or backtracking is, where you start to say something and as you're saying it you sort of change your mind maybe about what you want to say or how exactly you want to express it so you go back and you start again um, that can be really difficult for learners who are new to English because they don't really know where you're stopping and starting and it can become like a, a soup word soup um, another feature of spoken English that can cause difficulty are complex sentences and one uh, type of complex sentence uh, is one that uses many different clauses. So 
um, a clause is um, the smallest grammatical unit that can express a complete um, idea. Um, and a typical clause consists of a subject and a predicate. So that's like a verb and an object. So for example, subject would be I, and then a, a predicate would be like, like cheese, for example. So I like cheese would be a clause. Um, so how many clauses, for example, can you see in this sentence? Uh, and the answer is indeed three. So the first time I read this problem, this one, I got so confused is the second one and the third one is because I didn't know what it meant. So there's in this um, sen in this one sentence, there's three clauses. So there's there's quite a lot of information here already. So we can see how that can be confusing as well for learners who are new to English. And another feature uh, that can cause difficulty, which is very common in spoken English, um, as an example of complex grammar, cleft sentences. So here's an example. Um, uh, with what uh, of uh, what the teacher said. So the teacher said, what I'm going to do is introduce you to the farmer. So the cleft sentence, the cleft part is the bit at the beginning, which highlights new or important information. And that is designed actually to, to help signpost um, the important information, which is the next bit, introduce you to the farmer. But for learners who are new to English, the cleft bit at the beginning is, is confusing because it's not, not the normal um, uh, sentence structure, or not the basic straightforward sentence structure. So what you could do um, instead is, for example, say, I'm going to introduce you to the farmer. So you get rid of what I'm going to do is, and you just keep it very straightforward. I'm going to introduce you to the farmer. And then obviously vocabulary can be um, tricky as well. So we've got colloquialisms, um, they're often informal, they're not often quite not literal in meaning, and they can differ by region as well. So if your learners maybe spent a bit of time in one part of the country and moved somewhere else, then they may, they may pick them up, which is, which is fine, but they may not be used to um, colloquialisms um, in particular regions as well. Uh, Multi-word verbs, so verbs which are, have more than, one ver uh, more than one word, so a verb and a preposition. So we've got some examples here, get in or get into, go on, cut out, um, put away, for example. And these can be difficult. They're very common in um, spoken English and they can be difficult because they're often multiple meanings. So for example, if we've got go on, um, go on can be go on a ride, or it could be go on as in please continue, or it could be go on ahead or, or a number of different meanings. So one phrasal verb or multi-word verb can have several different meanings. So that can be difficult. Um, and sometimes the meanings are not literal as well. Um, some in terms of the grammar of the multi-word verbs, that can also be difficult because some take a direct object and some don't. Uh, and some uh, you can put the object, um, the position of the object in the sentence can vary. For, so for example, you could say for take back, you could say take it back, but you couldn't say take back it. Um, so it, they're, they're quite, they're, they're sort of, they sound simple, but they're because they're so common, but they can be, um, a bit tricky. There's also filler. So this is um, words that we use to fill the time. So for example, we use well or so to give ourselves a bit of time to think when we're, when we're talking naturally, um, which, is, which is natural and normal, but can sometimes confuse learners who are new to English, especially with words like well or so, where those words also have different meanings in different contexts, like do something well, or I don't feel well. And you've got unfamiliar meanings of known words like pen, which we looked at before. So, you know, learners wouldn't have necessarily known what a, pe a, sheep, a pen is for sheep keeping sheep in. They're more likely to think it was the pen that you write with. And then we've and then we've got specific academic language of the subject. And this is often referred to as tier three vocabulary, which you may well know. Um, and these are the subject specific words which are often explicitly taught in lessons. Um, feature on vocabulary roles and knowledge organizers and so on. And learners often have prime knowledge about um, these words, but not necessarily in English. So they might understand the words and the concepts, but in their own language, their first, second or other language. Um, and so with these kinds of words, it's, it's not so much about helping, not necessarily about um, helping them acquire the knowledge of the, of the vocabulary item, in terms of the meaning of it, but rather helping them put 
um, a, an English word to a known concept. But general academic language may, which is often referred to as tier two vocabulary, is a language which is more typically associated with written text, but not necessarily subject specific. So we've got words like systematically, represent, to refer to. Um, and these are often missing from subject glossaries. Um, so not knowing these words, uh, many of which will um, might be uh, the verb in a set of instructions, um, for example, refer to, um, they'll, that might create another barrier to understanding tasks. Okay, so we've also then got some pronunciation features uh, that can cause difficulty for new to English learners, pronunciation features of natural spoken English. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you some of these little clips from the instructions that we just heard. And I'd like you to listen. And for the first two, uh, how does the teacher pronounce do and you in the first video? And how does she pronounce would and you in the second video? Do you think you can help me? Play that again. Do you think you can help me? And then the second one. So would you change the number of sheep in the smallest pen? Or would you change the number of sheep? Thanks. OK, so. Um, I'll just play those to you one more time. Do you think you can help me? So would you change the number of sheep in the smallest pen or would you change the number of sheep? So uh, what do you notice about the pronunciation? Um, I'm not sure if this is right, but I think just listening to it, um, I felt like it sounded like one word, like when she said do you, it was quite it was quite quick it was quite fast so it just felt like I was listening to one word and it wasn't two separate words that's what I felt exactly and I've just read the chat box and Ellie said exactly the same thing <laughs> that's exactly right um so that's right so that's called um assimilation when two words um ended up sort of t turning into one one sounding like one word so that can be tricky um because learners might not understand might not recognize that as two words they might think oh what's this new word that i don't i don't know what you're saying um so that's just something to be aware of okay so we'll listen to uh, the next one now um i would like you to think about what happens to the in what right you know what one more time right you know what okay any ideas drops the t that's right exactly so that's uh an example of elision so these are all features of uh, something called connected speech so when we talk naturally we speak um at a speed where sounds change depending on what words come together um and in this case the t yeah, exactly is is dropped so again, learners might might not recognise the word what by listening to the teacher say what, even though it's a feature of natural speech. OK, and then we'll listen to the last one. What happens to the O in the word to? Thanks, Year 5. With your help, I will be able to arrange the sheet yeah. in seven different ways. Any Thanks, thoughts? Year 5. With your help, I will be able to arrange the sheet in seven different ways. Is it a number or is she saying two? Uh, yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, so that so the child's, because she also had some numbers in, in that sentence also. So it's like uh, the confusion of a number or two. I only yeah. heard the t. Yeah. Well, it could be both actually, yeah. So we've got obviously the, the, the number two sounds the same as the word uh, two, as in the preposition to. So that's definitely true. And I think in this example, you're right, um, uh, Anila, that she, what happens is the, the vowel sound uh, it becomes weak because in connected speech, you don't say, I'm going to the supermarket because it sounds very strange. That's just not how we speak. So it's what happens in natural speech is that sometimes um, the vowel sounds are uh, weakened. So she says to instead of to. Um, so these are just really just to highlight uh, or um, some features of natural spoken um, pronunciation feet, some natural pronunciation, some pronunciation features of natural spoken English that you're that might cause some difficulties for your learner. So we're not saying that. In fact, I, I want to emphasize that it, it's not a good idea to speak um, very disconnectedly because that that's not a, a natural model for learners and we don't want learners to be going around saying things un, th that sound very 
unusual and, and un, unnatural. Um, so we do want to make sure that we speak naturally, but but by slowing down, what we can do is minimise um, some of these um, things from happening. So just s slow down a bit and um, I think just be a bit more aware, but not um, oh, don't overemphasise things. So try to speak naturally, but at a normal pace. And also just, just be aware that um, learners might not um, hear things the way that you, you or I may hear them in that sense. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video of a teacher giving some instructions in Danish. And I'm going to ask you afterwards what the lesson is about. Okay, so vores tema det er jo jorden rundt eller verden rundt, og vi har besøgt alle kontinenterne. Vi har besøgt Asien, Nordamerika, Sydamerika. Vi har besøgt Antarktika og Europa og Australien. Vi mangler bare Afrika. Så du skal forestille dig nu, at du er i Afrika på en helt fantastisk rejse gennem den afrikanske savanna. Du sover i telt under stjernehimlen, og du rejser i en jeep. Du ser en masse dyr i, øh, i savannaen. Du skal nu skrive et dagbogsindlæg om, hvad du har oplevet i dag, og hvordan det var. Hvilke dyr har du set? Hvad lavede de? Og hvordan var det at se dem? Hvordan var det at sove i telt? Okay, værsgo. Any idea? Yeah, Africa, the savanna. Mm -hmm. Those were certain words. Continent. Mm -hmm. up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think everyone sort of heard the same same things. Um, right, so we're going to watch the video again and let's see if you've got any further ideas about um, whoops, about what the what she's asking us to do. Hi. So, vores tema er verden rundt, og vi har været i Nordamerika, Sydamerika, Antarktika, Australien, Asien og Europa. Nu mangler vi bare Afrika. Du skal forestille dig, at du er i Afrika. Ja, du er i Afrika. Du skal på en safari. Du sover i telt under stjernehimlen. Du rejser i en jeep. Og du ser en masse dyr. En løve, der brøler. En zebramor og hendes føl. En elefant i mudderbad. Nu skal du skrive et dagbogsindlæg. Masai Mara, Kenya, den 23. juni 2017. Det har været en dejlig dag i dag. Skriv, hvad du så på din rejse i dag. Skriv, at du så i telt. At du så en elefant taget i mudderbad. At du kørte i en jeep. Skriv, at du så en zebramor og hendes lille føl. Skriv, at du hørte en løve brøle. Okay? That's cool. Okay, so um, any more ideas about that? What did, what more specifically? Okay, so very much, very much going into um, into depth about the continents. I, I heard a number of those continents being mentioned, and then, then a real focus on Africa and 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 really focusing on the safari, what you would find there. Um, and I liked the way that she was trying to explain it with the visuals as well. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Masai think... Mara. I think she was uh, same as what Ellie is saying as well. Um, I think she was saying the instructions to write down what you see um, during this Masai Mara Kenya safari, what you did, you sat in a jeep, 
you saw these animals, the different types of animals. Um, so I don't know whether she's getting them to write an experience or a diary entry or something, but she was quite specific and she was quite animated as well. And there was a lot of hand gestures. So you could really tell like when she was doing the animals, she was, you know, she she was doing really good um hand gestures and even when she was saying writing it down she was using her palm of her hand and she was showing you that you know she was asking them to write it down but she was actually showing them as well what she meant mm, absolutely and that really helps doesn't it the showing and saying it at the same time making that connection between the the gesture and the words yeah Absolutely. Um, what else helped you to understand? So Anila's just mentioned um, the gestures um, and the pictures. Anything? Was there anything else? Um, I think names uh, of places like so she mentioned um, Kenya, Masai Mara. These are universal names that you would kind of understand. In you know, when you say the word Kenya, you would know that in different languages. Even if you came from a different country, you would associate that actually we're talking about somewhere else mostly. Um, and I think even when she was saying elephant, it, it sounded like elephant. So you, there were some words that were universal that most people would be able to, well, some people would be able to understand. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So there, there are some words which I think, uh, essentially words which are sort of borrow words. They appear in one language and then other languages think, oh, actually, that's a perfectly good word for that. I'm going to take that and use that as well. So I think that happens quite a lot and that you're absolutely right to say that that does help with understanding. And I think that's what the reason why we all knew it was about a safari in the beginning, wasn't it? Because of the, the word safari that we yeah. already know. Um she also had, oops, not going to show again. She had the words written on the board as well. So do uh, eat Africa. So she was showing them with visuals. So having this idea like imagining, and then she showed imagine do uh, eat Africa. And she showed uh, that as well. And then she has the um, instructions on the board as well. So she's got visuals and uh, gestures and um, written instructions as well. Um, she also slowed down a lot and she paused in between each of the um, uh, stages of the instructions to give learners a bit more time to process what each one was about. I really like that one of the guy lying down <laughs> with the stars in the tent. <laughs> okay, so um, we are going to have a look lastly then at um, checking understanding. So we're not, we're not going to go into breakout rooms, but I want you to just take a moment on your own and um, think about checking understanding. So we've got these three strategies for checking understanding. Um, so the first one is that the teacher asks, do you understand? The second one is that the teacher gets the students to tell him, her or them what they're gonna do. And the third option is uh, the teacher asks short, easy to answer checking questions. For example, how many questions are you going to write about what, how long have you got? So which of just take about 30 seconds now to think which of those do you think would be the most effective and why and then I'll I'll ask you for your feedback for your input in a moment yeah so I thought that um I sort of say that firstly I think that all of them are quite good for different reasons um and they all have their purpose in the classroom but I think that B is a really good one to because you're not prompting the students, you're getting them to come up and reiterate what you've already told them in their own words. And you can see if they have any misconceptions, what they've missed. But then also if um, for a child who is you particularly know struggles with understanding, asking short questions like C probably would help them more to remember and understand what they have to do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do like all of them, but probably B. Thank you. I think is the best one. Thanks. Um, yes, I agree with that totally. Um, I think sometimes when we say the word, do you understand? It, it can be quite, um, quite a powerful statement for someone who's thinking, um, you know, and they're in a panic mode and they just nod their head. Um, B is the one that I always tend to um, go with because I think it 
it's just getting them to explain in their own way Mm -hmm. um and then perhaps you just correcting if you need to do it in a very sensitive way and I think that will build a rapport with that child Mm. um in a positive positive way and I think C helps as well because small bursts of intervention um you know interactions with the child about asking them um you know is this okay what should we do now um that's key as well thank you very much um yeah I I kind of agree with everyone I think like for me, I would possibly do all three, depending on the level of proficiency of English that that child has. I've got, I would say in my class, I would probably use all three for different children in my class from their understanding being an EAL child. I think with C, sometimes it is quite important to ask those questions because some sometimes that child won't just tell you what they've understood, but they have understood, but they just won't answer when you said have you you know can you tell me what you're going to do because it's such a broad such a broad uh, Mm, question that you're asking them to break it down it's far more easier to get a response from them um so I find myself doing all three in all honesty I think those I think you've all got really those are all really valuable um comments um so and and I agree with you so the what I would what we would say is that exactly that with the the do you understand question uh, in fact with all of them I think that the key thing is what Anila just said is it depends on the proficiency of the learner um, if we're focusing mostly on band A and B students here so learners who are quite new to English um, the first question do you understand not not super useful as for the reasons that you said they might not understand and they might just say yes anyway um, and well that's the main thing and I don't know even if English isn't your an additional language or whatever it's still I I sometimes still say yes I understand because I don't want to be put on the spot in front of other people so um and but again that will depend on you know the context uh, and the proficiency in English but for learners at band A and B would not really recommend that one um for the second uh way of doing it um it's exactly for that reason I think Anila just said that sometimes learners who are may understand but they might not have the language to express the way uh, that, that they've understood so they might try to tell you and they're struggling to produce the language of the instruction but actually they do know what they have to do so that may not be the best well, that's not necessarily the best way to get information about whether or evidence of whether or not the learner knows what they need to do next um, um, but then the third uh, option it does exactly that which you said so it gives it gives learners an option so that you you're doing the legwork in terms of the language for them and they just need to give you a yes no answer or a short answer so how many questions you're going to write all they have to say is five uh, about what safari uh, how long have you got 10 minutes or, or something and essentially that will give you um, very quickly and uh, evidence whether or not the learner understands what what they need to do and you might not just you might not need to you might not ask them to give you anything verbally. You might ask them to point at something or show you a picture or or say yes or no or something similar. So, And I think that actually this can be a bit trickier than, than it initially looks. So you might want to practice writing some of these if you think about some instructions that you want to give that are quite long, perhaps. Um, because you, and the other thing to say is you don't need to check every single instruction that you're ever going to give your learner. Um, but if it's going to be a bit uh, co- slightly complex or it's got several stages to it, you might want to check check those instructions and to make sure that you're checking the instructions uh, well. You might want to think of a couple of checking questions, it, you know, uh, in advance when you're thinking about, oh, it's quite long. What can I say to make sure that they understand? Um, so there is a task which I don't think we're going to have time to do now, but w- which is exactly what I've just mentioned. So um, what you might want to do after the session is um, have a look at some instructions. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'll just show you as an example. So we have on your resource um, some instructions. I'll put them in the chat box so we can see them or maybe you can see in your resource. So here they are. So these are the instructions. In the envelopes, you've got three pens. 
and 24 sheep, put an even number of the sheep in each pen. The smallest pen can only have two sheep in it. The largest pen needs to have the most sheep in it. Find as many answers as you can. Start with two in the smallest pen and four in the medium pen. You've also got a copy of the rules to help you. So this is from the example video that we saw. And this would be a good time to check understanding because there's quite a lot of instructions. Um, so as an example, one way we, we've got an example here of some some things you may some questions you may want to do ask to check and in, instruct these instructions. So it's a sort of combination of questions and um, uh, um, demands. It's not the right word, but you know what I mean. So we've got the first one, for example, is so show me the envelope. So you've said all these instructions I've sent to you in the chat box and then we're checking. So we're saying show me the envelope and then the kids show the envelope. How many sheep? And then you show up the picture of the sheep. Do you have? And then hopefully they say 24. How many pens? Hold up a picture of the pen. How many pens do you have? OK, show me the smallest pen. So then you're checking that they understand the word smallest. How many sheep can you fit in the smallest pen? OK, can you use three sheep in the smallest pen? You may want to ask that, but too many maybe. Show me the largest pen. Can you put an even number or an odd number in the pens? So then they would say even number. And how many answers do you need to find? Uh, lots or many. And then show me the rules. And then you can say, okay, good. The rules can help you remember what to do. So that's a, a sort of quick breakdown of how you might want to check understanding. So a bit of, because there's quite a lot of instructions here, there's quite a lot of checking questions, but it should really help um, to make sure that everybody knows exactly what it is they need to do. So just a quick rundown then for checking understanding. So better to use short answer or closed questions for new learners who are new to English. Make sure the language you're using is simple, easy to understand. Use pictures or realia, so objects where you're appropriate. Ask them to point to pictures, words or materials. You could use red or green cards for true or false, for yes or no. So give the whole class a little set and they just hold it up. Uh, or the same with thumbs up or thumbs down. You could say yes or, or no. Um, or you might want to use um, yeah, gestures with, with questions. And a sort of summary now as we're coming to the end of the session of what makes um, instructions clear and comprehensible. So we've uh, said that slowing down can help give the uh, short and simple instructions. So just one uh, sentence for each key piece of information. Use gestures like uh, our Danish teacher did drawings and pictures, um, better to demonstrate rather than explain, which I think one of you guys said earlier. Um, so stage the instructions, so make sure that they've got to have it in the right order. Uh, check that the students have understood what to do. So make sure that you get evidence by asking them questions. And you might want to plan the instructions in advance if you know that it's gonna be a bit of a complex task. And just sort of finally coming back now to the early career framework, which Karen touched on earlier. So Karen mentioned that the early career framework doesn't actually have any focus on EAL. But if we look at standard seven, um, we can see that uh, the that the uh, grading language is, is still important and this is reflected in those standards. So it says, for example, um, that teachers should give manageable, specific and sequential instructions and use consistent language and nonverbal signals for common classroom directions. So if we consider what manageable language is, we need to also then think about what comprehensible English is for learners who use English as an additional language. Um, and what I would strongly encourage you to do after the session is go back to the recording that you made or the notes Shah, um, of the instructions that you gave and ask yourselves, oops, sorry, these questions. So would those instructions be easily understood by learners who are new to English? Why, why not? How could you grade them to make them even more comprehensible? And what questions could you ask to check understanding? So you might, I don't know if you might wanna take a quick picture of this now and then. Um, we've got some courses coming up, but I won't bore you with the details of that now, but you can go to the website and have a look if that's helpful. We've also got some great ideas pages, which you might be interested in, um, which you can find on the main page under EAL programme and guidance. And the great ideas pages 
um, provide uh, ideas like information on bilingual dictionaries, how to use substitution tables, a, a range of strategies you can use to support learners in class. Um, so have a look at that if you're interested. And a final, finally, just to say thank you for, uh, for coming and staying with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank um, you. A massive thank you to Emily and Karen for today's session. Hopefully it's been of great use to you.